Let's tell our wonderful audience, why is populism on the rise? I want to start by telling you a story. Imagine that it's 50 years ago or 40 years ago. You live in London, or maybe you live in Idaho, or maybe you live in Liverpool. And you have dreams. Your dreams are not amazing dreams to be a millionaire or a zillionaire. Your dreams are simple. You want to have a house, car, holiday, feed your children, have regular employment, live a normal life. And in those days, those dreams are realistic. You could expect to get a job at a factory, in a mine, or the industry that uh, serves your town. But nowadays, fast forward 50 years, what are those dreams? Vast amounts of the world, of the Western world, have been deindustrialized. The mines have gone, the factory doesn't exist, the industry doesn't exist. What are your options? Your options are a zero hours contract, driving for Uber, maybe, uh, some kind of new flexi job in the wonderful tech economy that we're promised. Now, there's nothing wrong with those things in themselves, but they're not really a way to feed a family, to give any sense of security, to push the basic buttons in all of us that want security, that want to know that we can be provided for and we can provide for those we love. So that world has gone. It's all gone. And if there was any doubt about that world going, it was in 2008. What happened in 2008? The financial crash, the crisis, and what did we see happening? The banks getting bailed out, the people not getting bailed out. And those trends which we saw of deindustrialization, of mines shutting, of factories shutting, of, of outsourcing to China have only arisen. So here you would think is a massive opportunity for the left. Here is the left, which has always been supposedly on the side of the workers against the bosses. Simple class-based politics. The left, the trade union movement, the socialist parties, they stand up for the everyday working people. What has happened? Have that stepped into the gap? No, not at all. What we've seen is the left, or much of the left, fall upon itself into, in, the, in the world of gig and the whirlwind of identity politics. Race, gender, and sexuality, all of these things are important, and it's very good that there are movements to push, of course, for equal rights for gay people, equal rights for women, and equal rights at the workplace. But it's become the overriding impetus of much of the left, and that's left a vacuum. Because when everyday people see that the left is engaged all of the time in ideological feuding about these issues, which are important issues, as I say, I'm not marginalizing them, but they are not dealing with the primary issues of most people, which is, how am I going to get a regular job? How am I going to take my family on holiday? How am I going to feed my family? In that vacuum will step another force, and that force is populism. Now, we hear a lot about populism, and there's a lot of sneering about populism, because populism basically means it's popular. It's vox populi, the voice of the people. So when the people's voice is not being articulated by those parties on the left that are traditionally supposed to articulate it and stand up for their interests, you will see other forces come in. And that is why we are seeing the rise of populism. And the more that we see on the left the descent into what's now called intersectionality, the idea that everyone is defined by their racial or ethnic or sexual identity group, and that class, simple class politics don't matter, the more people are alienated from the left and will support populists. So what I want to say in conclusion is workers of the world unite, to paraphrase Karl Marx, all you have to lose is your intersectional silo. Wow. Professor Fuller, that's, that's, uh, that's okay. quite something. Well, so first of all, let me say that um, I agree with a sort of the basic no, point. No agreement allowed here. It's <laughs> no, 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 because no. There's battle, a general battle, Steve. No, 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 it's a battle, but the general <laughs> level of agreement is, in fact, that the left has failed uh, and that identity politics is, is a kind of symptom of the failure of the left. But I do think that in a, in a fundamental sense, and so f is that for a long time in modern politics, we've engaged in, in, a, in a sort of situation where the left, in particular, has tried to reinforce people's identities while at the same time trying to endorse a kind of progressive economics 
And that progressive economics ranges across the board. I'm not just talking about any kind of hard socialism, but also welfare state and so forth, that in a sense argues for the dynamism of the economy where you would expect over time that people would get used to changing their identities. Okay? And so the left has been kind of duplicitous in this regard. Right? On the one hand, it kind of one reinforces that there's value in remaining, let's say, in the traditional jobs of your fathers and mothers and so forth. Right? This is what class-based politics was about. Right? It's about what labor unions were about. And that just, in a way, ossifies the dynamism that is inherent to the progressive visions of both capitalism and socialism. And so the left, especially in the Western world, has been very self-divided, and I do agree that in a sense this kind of discussion <laughs> has uh, you know, become very much evident, and this is true not just in the UK, but it's true in Germany and France and so forth, and I think it's really kind of interesting in terms of a way of breaking through this, and whatever you think of somebody like Emmanuel Macron, for example, he broke through this, okay? He broke through this, where he basically sort of said, look, you know, this is like France on the march, right? In a sense that we are talking about a kind of new world, right? Where we're not going to be organized according to traditional class base, whatever gender base, whatever boundaries, but we're going to move forward together in some kind of dynamic, perhaps undifferentiated way. So, for example, the way I would interpret intersectionality, for those of you who care about these kinds of issues, right, is I think the issue about intersectionality is giving people the choice to decide whether they in fact define themselves in terms of class, race, gender, or whatever, right? There are all these multiple identities out there in a sense, and that people ought to actually have the choice to decide which one they're going to be identified with, right? And if we actually move in that kind of direction, then identity politics might actually have done some good. Great, thanks so much. If you haven't noticed, you'll see at the back here we have a live vote. You can vote too by clicking on the link. I'm surprised. To see uh, how we're doing. It's, <laughs> it's so, almost like the Brexit vote, Adam. Well, yeah, exactly. 49.51. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> ah, ah, <laughs> no. okay. What's your response to the, the professor? Well, if Emmanuel Macron, the great hope of the kind of liberal centre left, is doing so well, then how do you explain Marine Le Pen's results in the EU elections? Good question. No, 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 for sure, no. I, so in other words, I'm saying there is an issue here about how people self-identify, right? So there's a sense which populism is in the first instance responding very, very directly to the idea that people are, are, are in a quandary about how to self-identify. But the question before us is not whether you identify, you know, whether you should identify in a particular kind of way, but rather whether you will have the environment to select your identity for yourself. And if you're any kind of capitalist, or I would say socialist, and you're progressive in your thinking, this is where you should be focusing your attention. The problem isn't identity per se, but the idea that people have to be stuck with a particular identity. If Emmanuel Macron is such a fantastic politician, how do you account for... I didn't say he's perfect, okay? <laughs> I'm just results. trying to find someone who's heading in this direction. <laughs> okay, let, okay we, can, we can move on from that. I, I think uh, it's true what you say, and to some extent we do need identity politics because, of course, we need feminism, we need gay rights, we need anti-racism. But it's now developed to such an extent, it's such a, a, a smorgasbord of identities that people are focusing so much on the micro delineations of, of these things that they're forgetting their overall interest. What no. is the average person's no, overall interest? That's true. I and, haven't and, finished. What is the <laughs> average person's overall interest? It is economic. Economics are the primary driver of politics. Money and the distribution of money is the primary thing of what politics should be about because that is the first thing that people think about. How am I gonna pay the bills? How am I gonna put food on the table? How am I gonna house my family? What security can I offer them? Not which little silo of intersectional identity politics yeah, do I fit yes, in? Yes, uh, no, look, I agree, I agree with what I'm you're saying, your except, okay, no, no, I, right, I agree with what you're saying, <laughs> except that none of the typical ways in which identity is being defined actually address this issue adequately, including class. Class is no longer a relevant category, and one of the things that we're finding, which makes it difficult, I think, from a cultural standpoint, is that e even issues like race and gender aren't so relevant with regard to the fundamental issues that you're talking about quite legitimately.
But how can you say class is no longer relevant? Class is no longer relevant in the sense of, you know, in Britain there used to be the working class, the middle class, and the upper class. Class is relevant in the sense of the extreme concentration of private and public wealth in the hands of a tiny percentage of people. I've never been more relevant than ever. That's true. I don't deny that. Whether class is quite the way to describe that is another matter. Uh, but I generally agree with the point that part of what we have to do is to sort of break, because the, way in, the reason why uh, wealth is so concentrated is because it's easy for people to actually transfer wealth to future generations. It's not because there's a certain kind of elite group of people who are producing all the wealth in the world. It's rather the people who have had wealth from their parents and their grandparents and so forth have an easier time, in fact, transferring the wealth forward. Are you referring to Donald Trump when you say that? <laughs> well, yes. Well, actually, I'm, you know, uh, you know, Piketty, Thomas Piketty, of course, if you know something about you know, capital in the 21st century, that's his argument. And I guess maybe we probably aren't on, in disagreement on that point. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> actually, See, no, we I, actually I, do I, kind I of wanted, agree. I wanted to ask you, I mean, but don't you think that like, identity and economics coincide? Like, so if you're, if you're black, you're more likely to be poor than if you're white? Absolutely, yeah, uh, but that's your actual objective identity. What I'm talking about here is the theoretical base of identity politics. I mean, of course, if you're black in America, it's, it's more likely that you're going to be poor than if you're white and living on the Upper East Side in New York. Yeah, of course it is, and you're more likely to be incarcerated and have less economic opportunities. There's no, there's no question of that, but that's an objective reality. And, I'm not, and as I said repeatedly, I'm not denying the importance of anti-racist politics and feminism and gay liberation. All these things are important. But what I'm saying is that the left has got itself into such a kind of self-involved vortex with these things that it's lost the broader picture. No, no, I, so I agree again, except to say, <laughs> no. Stop it, agreeing. No, no, sorry. <laughs> except to say that I don't think I think what we're seeing, you know, if there, there are two ways of thinking of identity politics at the end of the day. One of them is in terms of what you've just described as objective, where you're, you know, you're black, you're a woman, whatever, right? And this then has kind of knock-on effects with regard to your economic prospects. However, I think the other side of identity politics, and this is where it gets kind of interesting, and this is where I come from, is that you could change, as it were, your objective indicators. What's an objective indicator? Well, no, no. So if we're talking about race, class, see, gender, right. all yeah. those kinds of things, yeah. right? Because that's the way, in fact, we're able to determine the kinds of points you're making. Mm -hmm. But if you're actually able to change the categories, okay? And I would say, for example, you know, as we do better DNA scanning and you can find out, you know, where, where various aspects of your genome came from and so forth, notions like race are going to disappear just as a matter of course, especially as more and more people find out you know, just how much they're involved with other kinds of races and so forth. And I think that's kind of the general trend we're going to, but the problem is progressive politics has not embraced this yet. I think you're right. I think because, and that's one ex uh, example of uh, the stasis of progressive politics. Yes, I'm I falling agree. asleep with all of this. I'm sorry, we agree. I'm sorry. sorry. I think like you're, that, I mean. you're so <laughs> wrong. You are, <laughs> you are so wrong. That's how I say. <laughs> okay, for, let me ask, both, ask you both a question. I mean, do you think populism is a good thing? The word good is not really the answer. It's not good or bad. Okay. It's, it's a factor. It's a reaction to a failure. It's filling a vacuum. But, and I think some, some aspects of populism can be good in, the, in as much as the unarticulated desires of many people are now being articulated. But it depends what that populism is. Okay, I, what's good pop so what kind of populism are you worried about? I'll bring you in. in sure, sure, sure. I would be worried about uh, the rise of the far right, that kind of populism. Of course I would be worried about that. Yeah. Okay, Professor. Populism is just democracy you don't like. <laughs> no, really, seriously. And I think that there's a sense in which, yes, there are all these populist parties, including ones which have this kind of strong racist bend to them. I don't deny this. Yeah. Um, but I think these things, I, I do... Maybe this is where I'm naive, and maybe we disagree on this point, is that I actually believe that democracy is sufficiently robust that if the people who hold, as it were, the correct views that we shouldn't be populist actually got better at campaigning and making their points effectively from a positive standpoint, rather than demonizing their opponents, they might actually win some elections. Because this is, I think, one of the consequences of what we see from Brexit and Trump's victories, right? Namely, if you look at the opponents who supposedly represented, you know, the, the, the view that says we should not be populist, we need to be in this country, it was basically very negative. 
It was very negative. And, and, and the thing that so-called populists offer is the prospect of a kind of new vision, which I think is completely fraudulent, but nevertheless, from a rhetorical standpoint, is incredibly powerful. How is it fraudulent? I actually don't believe that we can have national identities and countries and so forth anymore. I think we're really moving away from this, especially if we do embrace any kind of dy dynamic capitalism. And I think the issue is going to end up being that people have to get used to change at a kind of global level impacting on them. And if people are worried about that, then you shouldn't have turned into the internet. But I you should have just got rid, you should have banned it, right? The point is the cat is, you know, the genie is out of the bottle here. But well, that is the greatest recruiting speech I've ever heard for populism. The no, idea, but, but, but we have the, to be... Uh, the, idea, the idea that we have to abandon national identity, which is already becoming a dirty word, is one of the prime drivers of the rise of populism. Another catastrophic failure of the left to develop any kind in so many countries of any kind of healthy patriotism uh, patriotism has become a dirty word. Patriotism doesn't have to be, doesn't have to be exclusive. Patriotism is based finished. on myth. I haven't finished. It's not based on myth. It's based on a collective sense of national identity, a shared history and culture, and a shared set of no, values. You can get and a it collective... it exists in people's heads, and because it exists in people's heads, it exists, and it's not a myth. That, it's a reality. Okay, I'm sorry, that's professor. not good it's, enough. It's a reality <laughs> that many people don't like. I'm right? so, but too much disagreement you, now, you, okay? You, now, you can now get... I want to say this, that... <laughs> The, the failure of the left and of many liberals to acknowledge that is a prime driver in the rise of populism. When you tell well, people that, oh, I haven't finished. When you tell people <laughs> that it's, a, it's shameful to be patriotic, to be proud of your country, then they're going to run from your party like a mile. They're, it's it's it, it's just very clear that that's the vacuum. If you look at what's happened in Britain, in Britain there was a very you talk about social contracts. There was a very simple social contract in Britain. The government said. You hold a referendum, and if you vote to leave the EU, we will leave the EU. Has that happened? No. And what is the result? Within six weeks, a party has appeared to fill that vacuum, the Brexit party, which has got as many seats in the European Union as Angela Merkel's CDU. This is astonishing. And this shows you that a political vacuum will be filled instantly when the people's desires are not met by the politicians they elect. Professor Fuller. You can get collective identity without oh, referring God. to the... I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You people who are clapping, you are deluded. They are right? not deluded. Oh. No, because you can get collective identity without having any shared past whatsoever, and the Internet proves this. Okay? People are interacting with each other online from different places, and, they, and, and what you get in a self-organizing fashion is new senses of identity forming that are not parasitic on the old largely myth mythological identities of the past. And I think that should be in a sense, you know, I agree that we do need collective identities, but how these collective identities uh, uh, are formed need not be based on mythologies of history that are half forgotten by people and end up having pernicious effects with regard to excluding people. And that is always the problem of the past, right? Of appealing to the past as a basis for identity is that you say, you don't come from our family. You don't come from our tradition. You don't come from this, therefore you can't really be part of us. And I think that is what we're seeing at the moment. Thank you so much, Professor. Sorry. I want to open this up to, our, uh, to the audience. I've got a question for Professor Fuller. You were talking about these collective internet-based identities, but <laughs> as far as I know from sociological literature, internet-based engagement is hard to convert into real-life engagement. That's true. Political mobilization, because it's a low-level engagement. No, no, I agree with you 100%, and that's where the progressive po politics needs to begin, because I think there's an open question at the moment as to whether the state, if we're thinking about the state as kind of the vehicle, right, for whatever we're talking about here, whether that's going to survive. But the state has, actually has to start to capture these kinds of self-organizing groups as being the way in which people self-identify. So, so I do think that there is a, so there is a, 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 a kind of ta task for progressive politics here. Can I, can I just come in on that? Yeah, sure. I, I, think, I, I 
very much disagree with the idea that the internet is going to be this fantastic forum where we all develop healthy collective identities and all want to cooperate with each other. I mean, anyone, just look, log on to Twitter, as I do most mornings, and the stream of abuse and hate yeah, and picking point. things apart okay. and people just yelling that's and That's the history of democracy. I, yeah, yeah, but I mean, that, that may be the history of democracy, but well. it's, it's the present day reality of the internet. Yes. And the internet is also a, a driving force where people, again, can get into an, an echo chamber where they just interact with people who think the same as them. They have their Twitter feeds on the same, uh, for, for the following the same people that are going to reinforce their ideas. I don't know many people that are getting challenged on Twitter and where I, I, I disagree that this is going to be an arena where a lovely, healthy We're thousand flowers are going to bloom. We're only in the beginning. This is the Thank growth so pains of democracy. Thank you very much. A great question. Another question, please. Um, my question would be, do you think the left is killing itself, committing suicide? Because eventually, if you look at it, identity politics diverts into an infinite number of identities that people could choose from, and then you just get back to the individual. And as for party-based um, democracy, how do you know democracy works if the voter turnout is low? For example, in 2014, the EU voter turnout was like 49%. How do 49% define what 100% of people should live by? Okay. Well, first of all, I, I, okay. look, my, my point about identity politics is if we could diffuse identity politics by having so many multiple identities that have, at the end of the day we actually have to make appeals to the individual, that wouldn't be a bad thing. Right? That in a sense, we might think of identity politics as kind of a problem with democracy because what it does is it kind of puts individuals in a position where, th where they think they have to actually identify with a larger group in order to be able to express themselves. But if we have a mature democracy, then the, the, the dissolution of identities, the fact that you can move between identities, that, that you cannot predict the outcomes of elections, that should be seen as a good thing. Right? That is part of a mature democracy. Low turnout, is that democracy? Well, democracy is also, not voting is also a choice. I mean, if low turnouts are to be regretted. People fought and died for centuries to have the right to vote. And universal franchise is an amazing and wonderful thing. I mean, if you just think of the history of humanity, how despots and kings used to rule, and now we have the chance every few years to just get rid of the ones we don't like. So it's absolutely regrettable, but it can also be a choice. If people choose not to vote, that is their choice. I don't believe that voting should be compulsory, as it is in some countries. So you're always, and in any electoral system, you're going to get anomalies. So in Britain, you had this anomaly where, because we have the first-past-the-post system, that means whoever gets the most votes in any constituency wins the seat. But uh, you can get a huge swell of support across the country in many constituencies, but you'll be unrepresented, uh, as, you, as did UKIP when it got several million votes in a general election and got one MP because it was spread across. So there's always going to be anomalies. People don't vote. This first past the post. Or you can have the Israeli system where uh, it's all proportional, uh, where every part, you know, there's a multiplicity of parties, and then, uh, rather than the British three-slash-four-party system, but then you get tiny parties holding the balance of power to make a coalition or not, and vastly disrep disproportionately represented in the political agenda. So there's no perfect system. But the point is, vote. Please, all go and vote. Thank you. Next question, please. I would like to ask if uh, populism prefers uh, a pro-actionary or a precautionary uh, this is to principle. Me. This is my distinction. OK. Um, so you mean that was a planted question, Professor? No, <laughs> it's not a planted question, but this is a guy who's obviously read my work. Can, can I explain Please. what he's talking about? Real quick, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, OK. So the, the difference between pro action, for those of you who don't know, the difference between pro actionary and precautionary has to do with attitude toward risk. Whether you see risk as an opportunity, which is the pro-actionary approach, which has often been motivating entrepreneurs and so forth, where the precautionary approach tends to see risk as a kind of threat, right? We're trying to avoid it. And if you think about European Union legislation on innovation, it's very precautionary in that respect, right? So that's a distinction that he's drawing attention to. And so he's asking whether populism is one or the other. I tend to think of, uh, of populism as, let's say, pro-actionary for itself, but generally pre precautionary with regard to the larger environment, okay? So I actually don't think populism is particularly conducive to a pro-actionary attitude if what you're imagining is a kind of Silicon Valley, very innovation-oriented thing. I don't see p populism as supportive of that. Great, thank you. Next question. As we can see, 
that populism is quite um, based on like very simple messages, like for example, Trump's "Make America Great Again." Um, do you think that in the future, like all parties, both on the right and the left, are going to realize that they don't really want to be like putting out these complicated messages and just all want to be populist and make these easy messages so that um, people are going to understand it more easily? Well, I hope not. I mean, I've said here, I think, some of the reasons why populism has come up, but I, I'm, I, I don't think it's an es uh, essentially healthy development because populism is a reflective set of reactions in many ways to, peop to people's feeling that their needs are not being met. But uh, it is an incredibly complex world now, and I think it's the, it's the responsibility of political parties to get that across. So, uh, make America great again is a fantastic slogan, but it's also fantastic because it can mean whatever you want it to mean. And it's, it's full, but it's also empty. What does that mean? It means something what's in your head. Everyone who says that or hears it has their idea. It auto fills itself. What does it mean to make America great again? So, it's a masterstroke, it's a political masterstroke, but it's not a solution for a complex world. The world is very complex. There's globalization, the rise of China, automation artificial intelligence. I mean, these are the issues that people need to be dealing with and the left needs to be dealing with. And so I would want to see parties saying, actually, people, voters, this, we might not have all the answers for you immediately on everything, but these are the things we need to start thinking about and we'd like you to start thinking about as well. So it's more of a dialogue rather than parties saying, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, we're going to fix this, we're going to fix that. To say to people, people are not stupid. This is a complex, difficult world with many new challenges, and we're going to try and find solutions for those, and we hope that you can come with us on that. I'm going to say something kind of mildly positive about populism here, because first of all, I think one of the things that populism is succeeding to do, and Trump is a good example of this, but I think this has also been played out with the Brexit business, is that it's destroying the two-party system, and especially it's destroying the party way of organizing politics, okay? because people are now very mobile in terms of their thinking and so forth. And that's perhaps an unintended consequence of populism, because populism, in a sense, you might think of it as trying to you know, recreate collective identities from the past and so forth. But what it's done, from a negative standpoint, it's actually been very good. Namely, it breaks up very stale distinctions between left and right that really don't matter anymore. And so then we have a kind of challenge if we're trying to be progressive about how we should be organizing people. That's one point. The second point I would say is that this business about populists appealing to simple messages when we live in a complex world, again, this is just the latest phase of democratic politics, okay? There have always been simple messages presented. Populism cannot be blamed for this. Okay? We've always had commercial advertising for elections and so forth. It goes from the beginning of democracy. There's nothing intrinsically wrong with trying to provide simple messages for complex situations. That is, in a sense, part of the business of democratic politics. The problem is that the sort of people that we tend to support, us intellectual progressive people, aren't very good at it. I think that's a perfect way to end our discussion. Let's give these guys a massive round of applause. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh my God, 50-50. 50-50. <laughs> hey, hey. Thank hey, you. Hey. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Thanks for staying on the break. Thanks so much. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs>